ladies and germs. Welcome back to Furycraft once again. This is going to be my topic this time, and it's one which we've been meaning to talk about, which we have talked about in past ones, but now we've got a dedicated episode of this one. Hope all of you are keeping well, keeping safe on the other side of the internet, on the other side of the screen. I see you over there in your Batman boxes. I know you're wearing them, and I know a few of you is watching this sat on the loo as well. You probably are. But this is going to be about... So a few of mine events, favorite films, but also the ones that are the most of a ball ache like to try and get your head around. So these are going to be on plot holes, massive questions which have not been explained, not been explained very well, or just completely open-ended. So these are going to go in no particular order, and it's just all about the plot holes and the most unanswered questions in the X-Men franchise. So without further ado, let's get ready to run, boys and girls. So we're going to get straight into this one. The first thing which can be somewhat explained as me and Ben were bashing heads last night and we were trying to figure out um, the answers to a few of these different questions. We didn't go through all of them. We wanted to save a few for here. But one of the biggest ones which confused a lot of fans is I have a look a lot on Reddit when I'm looking at these questions and so on. And one of the biggest ones that fans are still confused about, unless you were paying attention in the old Brian Singer slash Brett Ratner films, is specifically in The Last Stand, is how is Charles Xavier alive in Days of Future Past? So I think it can be somewhat explained, but it's in a deleted scene, I think, when, when Moira Mataga, but we'll go into her later, um, when she's carrying after a patient, which is Charles's brother, twin brother? <laughs> Yeah, so the whole thing is that there's two deleted scenes. They kind of tweaked it a bit. So in Last Stand, they're in the classroom where Moira targets on about a comatose patient. They never fully exploit who it is or what they are, but just basically go along the lines of that he is a mutant with no potential because obviously being comatose, she can't have powers working if you're comatose. In the deleted scene, it's further explained that it's actually Charles's twin, which, for logic reasons, the fact that his ability is mostly down to telepathy, I think caused the twin to have brain damage to the point where there was no brain activity and basically was just a body a without a mind. Pretty much. Well, yeah, pretty much. And then, as you see in Last Stand, he basically fights Gene, Gene being powered by the Phoenix, which they don't say, but obviously fans would obviously guess. She wipes his complete body. Somehow, I don't know how his mind transfers from all the way in America to all the way to England, wherever the fudge it is. Basically transfers himself in his, de his vegetable brother's body, and basically that's it. Like he basically like talks to Moira and says that it's him, and basically has to do. I don't know what they even say. He basically just has to find a way of getting the X Men back together after Gene had basically wiped everybody apart and try to sort of fix what had to be fixed. Well, that's the thing. I'm not sure if it's a canon explanation, but it's the best answer that we... It's the best answer we have. I think it's the only way you can truly explain it, especially if you're an eagle-eyed viewer and you were listening and paying attention, because I think it's a very clever way of um, seeing if like the fans of the films were actually listening the whole time through the franchise. Is when there's that scene when he's in the classroom and he's talking about what if we took the consciousness from one body and put it into the body of this man? And so then it kind of goes, ah, it makes perfect sense. Like, if you were actually paying attention, that is. Yes, but the thing is, it's a bit of a cop-out answer as to why he's alive. Like, it's basically saying, I can copy and paste my brain into somebody else's body that's genetically the same as mine, but they have no brain, so they can't reject me. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, as well, is it's kind of playing on an idea of a story arc they had in the X-Men comics. I think it was in the 90s, where, for whatever reason, 
There was an amalgamation of Charles and Magneto's brainwaves forged and created onslaught, which was this monolithic physical representation of both their minds yeah. and decimated all the mutants. But at the same point, it's like, well, okay, so Charles is that powerful. If he was that powerful, how come he didn't go inside Jean to shut her down so then they could have just saved everybody instead of having pretty much everybody die? Pretty much. I mean, the thing is as well with Days of Future Past is they don't fully say as to how far in the future it is. No. Which, again, begs the question, how far were they able to go back if they had to warn the others to recruit everybody in the first place to save them, even though that is a bit of a loop in itself? (laughs) <laughs> because if you remember at the end of the Wolverine, obviously Magneto comes up to Wolverine and basically says that there's a war coming. That implies that obviously they've had to send somebody's mind back already to warn them about it because it hadn't happened at that point. Yeah, because obviously somebody either must have gone forward or somebody must have gone from there and gone backwards to warn them. But then that anything to do with time travel or anything like that is a ball like and it's very difficult to get right and to make it make sense because most of the time nine times out of ten it doesn't yes because the main reason why they chose wolverine for days of future past is because he's got a healing factor his mind can stretch further because it can heal as it stretches that's why they chose him but they even say within the movie that the best they can do is send somebody back days but Wolverine can go back decades. So the logic would be that they had to pick somebody slightly young enough to keep their mind intact, given the fact that obviously Magneto and Charles are pushing, what, 60, 70, give or take? Yeah. Their minds can't obviously bounce back as well. Given the fact that Charles is a telepath, It doesn't work because obviously when you go to Logan, his abilities are so destructive that they basically try to kill everybody. He has seizures. But except like when Wolverine went back in time and he ended up in, I think it was like in 1971, something like that. He was in New Mm. York. But at that time, where's his brother? Where's Sabretooth in all this time? This is it. Like there's a lot of... I assume that... I can't remember if it was around that time that like Wolverine was still in his little. Around that time, he would have still been in his little clique of buddies with like Ryan Reynolds and like Leah Schreiber and like the cast of um, the Origins movie. I think. Well, that's the thing because Wolverine Origins is set within the eighties. They are basically a one-man army during the Vietnam War. Because if you remember, there is a brief scene where they. Well, Vietnam, Vietnam Wars the, are over. Si- Vietnam was in the sixties. 60s okay so yeah so there's a bit of a blip between there and then because obviously the vietnam war that's where saber tooth and wolverine's relationship gets a bit strained because wolverine sees how dark and twisted saber tooth is because he tries to do certain things with the women which we can't say because reasons um and that's the reason why wolverine starts to basically quit and goes and has a quiet life that's where he meets his wife and it's like what five years give or take that he has peace and quiet it's not yeah it's not very long so but it makes me think like when was he in new york that's the thing when was he in new york well yeah but then the other thing is like where when was he there's a lot of if buts and maybes because obviously in the in the wolverine he saves that Japanese guy from the Hiroshima blast. Where was Saber Two for that as well? Because obviously they would have been both prisoners of war if they were working together. Exactly. So I was just like, okay, that's a massive jump. So how did he end up from going to like, I don't know, maybe New York now, Vietnam, then you've got uh, like obviously Canada, but then when was he in Japan? <laughs> Uh, God, Wolverine gets about a bit. Bloody hell. I like, know, and we're not even talking about the women. <laughs> well, yeah, well, to be fair, Wolverine's taste in women have always been a bit of a dodgy one, to say the least. Yeah, for sure. So, 
that's one which we, I feel we're going to have to come back to. But mm-hmm. when you were saying about all the different things, like the main meat and potatoes of this video is ever since the newer films came out, so First Class and so on, Days of Future Past and all that, it really muddled up the timelines that we have. Because, best example, Moira Mataga. So Moira Mataga, obviously, love interest of Charles, which we saw in First Class so and also in Apocalypse. So Moira Mataga, she was around in the 60s, around that time when First Class happened. Around that time, from what I've done with research and everything on Reddit and so on, she was around 30 years old. So 30, 31 years old around that time. But then, that means if the timelines are correct, Right up until Last Stand, so in Last Stand was in 2006, so in 2006, that would technically mean that during the time she was caring for what would be Charles's brother, she would be in her 80s. So how the hell does that make sense? Why is she young? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. That's the thing I've tried to... It doesn't get make my... any sense. Well, the thing is, I think everybody seems to have, like aging issues in that universe because we in like x-men apocalypse for example we got the (coughs) excuse me the teen versions of the class well the generic version of x-men where you got cyclops gene and all that lot in 1983 But in the flashbacks of Last Stand, where they meet Jean Grey in 1986, she's barely seven years old. Well, I think she must have been around like at least ten, maybe something like that. Give or take, but she's she's quite. She's nowhere near a teenager. No, so either they've all. And even another bit of an add-on around there: Charles was paralysed in the 60s, but in that flashback in 1986, he's still walking and he's bald. Well. I think for that one, I said to you that I'm wondering whether or not that is actually him standing there or whether it's one of his things where he can basically project himself in front of people because he does that within Days of Future Past with Raven as a way of like communicating, which is a kind of reasonable idea, but it's the fact that he's bald as well, they don't explain it until Apocalypse as to how he lost his hair, which is the most weird reason anyway. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, basically, the thing that I love about Apocalypse is the fact that they completely scrambled his origins to basically be more of a parasite mutant than anything else, jumping from body to body. Yeah. And the reason why Charles loses his hair is basically because Apocalypse likes being bald. That's basically it. Like <laughs> there's there's no reason for him to be bold. This no. the the armor itself can connect through him regardless. Like he doesn't need body hair or he could need body hair, who cares? But it's the most bizarre reason behind it all. But the thing that I love, right, is that the actor, James McAvoy, actually did shave his head before that scene. So before that scene, he's actually wearing a wig, which is why his hair looks a bit more luscious and longer than the previous movies. Yeah. But it's quite funny that he got a bit too happy with it because they said we could literally just give you a bald cap and he just went, nope. Yeah, because I think he was doing another movie after that where he had to shave his head. I can't remember. It was uh, part of the Glass saga because you got Glass, you got um, Broken Split. That's what it was. Yeah, because I... I can't remember if it was around that time he was doing it for that film right afterwards. No, he basically they that well they had to rework the character because of him shaving his head for Apocalypse. So when it came to Split, they just had to rework the idea of it being that he had just shaved head and that was it. Well, the different ages of the characters and so on in like the different franchises of films. The only way I can really find any way of getting around that issue is that you can you just have to set it in its own different timeline. But then that doesn't make sense because First Class is an origin story. So, but the ages are still going to be wrong regardless. Well, the thing I'm also just picking my head through like plot holes as well is at the end of 
say first class is like the where everything still was consistent before days of future past how come moira mctaggart in last stand knew who charles was if charles wiped her memory of him in first class yeah this is the this is what annoys me is like prequels as i have said time and time again does never work because you're time constrained and you end up forgetting plot points from other movies um i mean the other thing as well with days of future past is that the so-called serum that beast makes for charles as a way to make him walk is also a cure for being a mutant as a temporary cure yeah I'm trying to figure out how does that fix paralysis. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Because I Uh, thought it only... Like, it was just... I think it was um, Hank which said it affects his... affects his mutations, obviously, his telepathy and so on. But but then also says that it cures, basically, his paralysis. But I can only assume it's because of the spinal cord attached to the brain, so on. I, that's the only really, only real reason I can think of. I don't know, because like the only reason why he's paralysed is because, obviously, Magneto is stupid enough to fly a bullet into his spine. Yeah. Like that. But the thing is, I would argue it would have been a better plot point if it was his own powers that made him paralysed, because I always assumed that from the comics. Like, I haven't done a lot of research from the comics, but I would assume that would be a better logic to it because a lot of the time with the mutants is that they're not perfect, that they do have certain issues with their abilities. And it makes better sense for it to be that it's their powers that makes them have a handicap as well as an ability instead of it just being Magneto fudged up and this is why he can't walk anymore. Yeah, definitely. But with like going back to Apocalypse as well. With Apocalypse, the biggest thing which really bugs me about that film is at the very end of Days of Future Past, you have Wolverine, who's... I don't know, obviously he hasn't got the original Wolverine's consciousness, so I don't exactly know how that Wolverine works, but regardless, whatever. And he's rescued by Stryker, which turns out to be Mystique. But then we see Wolverine becomes Weapon X in Apocalypse. So does that mean that Mystique turn is Mystique is responsible for Wolverine becoming Weapon X? But then it seems the original Striker in Apocalypse knows about the Weapon X program. So I'm just wondering how how does that work? I don't know. I mean, I just assume that she took on the form of Striker long enough to escape from that day. I mean, the only thing I can logically think is that Stryker may have been unconscious. He could have been whacked out by, like, one random bit of metal that Magneto just flung because Magneto's skill set is a bit... Like, you just hope for the best that some... Yeah. But obviously there's bit there were so many government officials there that they could have mentioned it offhandedly handedly that whatever happened to Wolverine that he had all those random pipes and survived being drowned and just came out fresh as a daisy so he could have gone hmm I could come up with a dastardly plan to weaponize this guy because obviously with the apocalypse version of Wolverine he's very feral because that's him in his berserker rage because part of the Weapon X programming was the point that they were going to we rework his mind to be a weapon that they could control. Yeah. But obviously things didn't happen. So I don't know. It's again, it's one of these random plot holes where we can kind of tie it, but we also trying to figure out how, when and why. Yeah, exactly. Just like, because that really sent me into a loop. So it made me think, is Raven, Mystique, responsible for creating Weapon X? But then, then like I was thinking, is Apocalypse in a timeline all of its own? It's its own alternate story, which I think it may be. I'm not sure, but maybe. Well, the thing is as well with the time travel of that is 
A lot of people speculated, and I think the director even said so just offhandedly, that the reason why Apocalypse never came about before that was because of Days of Future Past, that because of the influx of time travel, it just awoken him somehow in some bizarre way. Yeah, but, but I would argue that Apocalypse would have happened anyway. Well, yeah, this is it. Like, this is why I just don't understand their logic with time travel. I just don't think travel. it would have had any bearing on Apocalypse whatsoever. Boris wishes he could travel through time. When would you go back to? Boris would go back to just before you were offered a green cord so that you did not steal my airtime on this channel. Struth, you need help. It isn't my fault that your so-called talent isn't charismatic enough for these folks. <laughs> um, but the thing is, it's like... <sighs> Apocalypse should have happened regardless because the only thing. Moira was in Egypt randomly. Again, that was a thing that they didn't fully explain because. Yeah, because I think Apocalypse. When is Apocalypse set? 1986. Sorry, 83. Yeah, and yet Moira doesn't seem to have aged today. Yeah, I mean, the thing is. She goes to Egypt because they find a random tomb, but I can't fathom the logic as to why. She's not an she's not an archaeologist. She's a CIA or FBI agent. That's what I don't understand. Surely an archaeologist would have gone to do that job, not her. Hmm. Because I. <sighs> it's. <sighs> The only thing that I think is consistent from the majority of this is that Magneto was corrupted by Nazis. Like, that's the only thing that's been consistent from both different timelines. I like the way that they did his whole backstory. I liked the way they did that. I think it just gave a lot more gravitas to why Magneto, uh, Eric Lencher, well, Ian McKellen, you can kind of see... In a way, you could kind of believe that it would be the same. You can kind of believe it would be the same, like actor. In a way, it's just the way that, like, it's just the way it was portrayed with uh, Michael Fassbender playing that character so well. Basically, Ian, Ian McKellen it was just. I love the way that was like that was done. So that I think that's kind of the reason why Magneto became one of my favorite characters in X Men, aside from Wolverine, obviously. Yeah, I mean, the thing is. The whole concept of both Magneto and Charles was slightly uh, mimicked by the ongoing race riots within the US with Malcolm X and... Uh, God, his other's name. I forgot the other guy's name. I'm going to go... King. That's the one. Basically, it was a mimic of their attitudes towards racism because that was the kind of point of the mutants within the comics and I think the thing is with Magneto is that even though his attitude was more violent and more destructive it had a bit more of an impact in terms of what they were like don't get me wrong I like Charles to a degree but his attitude to the problem was too passive because yes. at the end of the day yes mutants is quite scary but it's part of what happens. Like there is always going to be mutations, regardless, because things don't just suddenly stop evolving. And yet, the attitude of the government seemed a bit too extreme compared to the actions of, like, what five slightly chaotic mutants. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, as well, is you got. Um, the guy that Kevin Bacon plays, uh, Henshaw. Oh, what was what was his friggin' name? I swear it's Henshaw, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I I cannot remember his name, but I'm sure if you lot, if you've watched First Class, you should know what we're on about. But again, why wasn't that brought up sooner in terms of the previous films? Because that is still technically canon. Everything up until Days of Future Past is where things start to divert off. Yeah. So, technically, First Class is canon regardless. So then, 
again, they never explain what happens to Pixie. They never explain what happens to Banshee. Because they basically, they have their costumes just shown off in Days of Future Past in a random room in the Pentagon. And also, they royally fudged up Cerebro. Because in X-Men 1, it was Charles who said that him and Magneto built Cerebro. But yes. by the looks of it, in first class, neither of them had any part of it, which throws the first film out the window because it was made by Hank McCoy. Yes, it was, which again begs the question as to why, because Hank McCoy, at that point, he wasn't fully beast, because obviously in the comics, he wasn't a fully like beast version for a long, long time. He was just a random big dude that had very weird feet. But that's what makes me laugh, is that yeah. that was his original comic form, is that he was just a big dude with weird feet. Not the best power to have, which I'm glad they upgraded it. But again, it just begs the question as to why. Like, I mean, the thing is, as well, is... I just, it's just, you have, there's just continuity. Continuity is just... So obviously at the time Brian Singer had Brian Singer, the original director, like said, like, it states quite candidly that it was Charles and Magneto who built Cerebro. And then first class chucks all that out of the window and says, No, Hank did it. But then if it's meant to be an origin story, it's canon regardless. So trying to explain this is bloody hard. Yeah, because one other big issue is if Mystique and Charles grew up together, where the hell was she, was she for so long when it came to the first trilogy? Well, because the first, the first trilogy, another argument there is if they were so close in all the other films with James McAvoy playing Charles, in the first films, I want to and three, why do they seem like they don't know each other at all? Yeah. It's not even hinted they had a relationship or anything. But the other thing as well is in Last Stand, she gets the cure and she randomly transforms back to just being human. So then she barely looks, what, 30, give or take? Um, Round about that. Not very old. Like maybe mid-30s at a push. So then when they meet as kids, they're like, what? Eight or nine, if not a little bit younger. So that means they were round about round about our age, I'd say, in first class. I think yeah, round about our age. So, so yeah, but then so that but then if Last Stand's set in two thousand six, oh, that's... I see what, where you're going now. Yeah, so then she would logically be fifty something, if not sixty something, like no, to a degree. She'd be older than that. Well, like she'd if be at least like in her eighties by, by by the last stand. Well, if there's going to be teens during the nineteen sixties, that means that you've got to take away ten years for them to have met about when they're seven or eight. Right so about. that's nineteen fifty. So let's say nineteen fifty-five. Okay, they're about seven or eight. So it's about 50 years to 2003, give or take. So, yeah, it's about 50, maybe 60 at the most she should be. But again, yeah. it's like, how is it that she looks barely 30? Well, I think there was... Yes, it harkens back to when Beast is analysing her blood. So, basically, like, I think he said like something along the lines of that she doesn't age just like normal mutants or humans as she ages at a much slower rate. Yeah, but then surely, logically, that would be nerfed by the cure because obviously her ageing is down to her ability because being a shapeshifter means that she can regress yeah, so she's or... Cured, shouldn't she go to the age that she should be? This is what I mean. This is why it's always bugged me that she ends up being a very attractive 30-year-old. Yeah, but, which I'm sure, like, lots of teenage boys, when they saw that scene, just went... <gasps> yes. But then, again, the other thing I find really, really fiddly with the logic of that the cure is meant to take away their powers is that you see at the end of that movie, 
Eric gets stabbed with what three serums, like quite Four. a lot. Four, which means that logically he should not be able to get his powers back. Yeah, about but, about four or five. But by the end of the movie, he's got a coin or something, and he managed to make it twitch. He's yeah, he's like basically sat at a chess table by himself, and you see when he sticks his hand out, and it moves very slightly. So then the logic being is that obviously Mystique would get her powers back sooner if she only had she was one only dose. With one. Now. I know there's different classifications in terms of mutants and their abilities, but I would argue that Mystique is meant to be uh, a Omega level to a degree being a shapeshifter because it does take a lot of toll practice and a lot of physical energy to sustain one form for so long. Yeah. So the thing is, is like she ship shape shapeshifts between genders like that. Okay. That takes a hell of a toll to be able to shapeshift from a male to a female so quick. Talking of shapeshifting as well, I can't remember where it's in. I it's, think it's in Apocalypse. It's at some point in Apocalypse. If she can, if she, if like, when she shapeshifts and obviously is able to replicate clothing and so on, that would obviously be part of her body because she's materialized it from a mutation. How was she able to take her jacket off? I know that's. That's this isn't... something that's really pissed me off. I'm like, but, no, that shouldn't be possible. But it's happened more than once because it's happened with the previous actress that was Mystique. Because I swear it's either with Jennifer Lawrence or with the previous actress. There's a scene where she's wearing a jacket and she uses it as a way of like fighting yes. with people. Yeah. And it okay. really bugs me because it's like, but how is that possible? Because that would technically mean that's your skin. Yeah, that's part of her body, so she shouldn't be able to take it off. No, but it's, it's, it, it really bugs me because then... Because the thing is, like, you've got so many different shapeshifters within comics. One of the most powerful ones is a DC character known as Martian, Man Martian Manhunter. And within the whole scope of the Supergirl series, he's in it. They explain that their clothing is organic, so it mimics their like brainwaves, which makes sense because at least it shapes with them when they want to dress a certain way with a certain person. But when you've got someone who's mystique, who is pretty much naked the entire time, because that's the thing. I never understood that logic in the original movies, why they made her naked. Because in the comics, given the fact her costume is a bit of an odd loincloth thing. makes perfect sense, to be honest. Yeah. But the thing is with the comics is that she has a loincloth suit thing of sorts, which... Yeah, or she has like a long dress kind of thing. Yeah. But then at the end of Apocalypse, she does have a comic suit to a degree that does cover over her. But then it's never used again. Because then when it comes to uh, Dark Phoenix, she gets a new suit, which looks like a really low budget like sweatpants suit. Like They all seem to have the same yellow X like jumpsuit or something which begs the question does it react with her mutation because with I think they said in first class at least that all the suits was meant to be in sync with their abilities which explains as to how and why it was so durable because it had to flex with their XG yeah but it's like well how like how, like, how does that work? Yeah. But, no, I mean, it makes sense that she doesn't have clothes to wear, but it's very... <clears throat> it's hard work to try and figure out, well, if that's the case, then how is it that she's able to take it off if it's not actual clothing? Exactly. So she'd really be taking off part of herself, like her skin, like you said. Well, the thing is, as well, I'd argue, I wouldn't say her healing factor is as good as Wolverine's, but I would say it's almost as good. Given well, the fact she has to shapeshift, it has to take a toll on her to a degree. And given the fact that Wolverine, like, stabbed her in the first film. Hmm. And the thing is, they, they've always said in the comics that all mutants have a healing factor to some level. It's just some is more so than others. But again, it's like, well, who has more than someone else? Because Wolverine is literally healing factor. That's his whole thing of like 
of being a mutant because I would logically say that because of having such a strong healing factor, that's why he has the claws. Yeah. Because obviously his body's probably mutated so much that it creates claws, and that's just the reason why he has claws. Which leads me into this, actually, because I can't wrap my head around it. There's still not a card explanation. How has he got Metal Claws back at the end of the Wolverine into Days of Future Past? How? Why does he have Adamantium Claws again? <sighs> Because it's said that like the adamantium coats the bones, which obviously would have coated the bone claws. So it makes sense why the bone claws can come back. That makes sense. But it doesn't explain how the metal claws come back, though. Yes, because during the Wolverine, he has a fight with the samurai guy and the Mirasuma. And... <laughs> yeah. Now, from what I remember, I'm sure it said in Wolverine Origins that they basically had to inject him down to the cellular level, otherwise his healing factor would reject the metal. Right, yeah, because I remember in the cartoons as well, in the cartoons it was only coated on his bones, but they changed it in Origins so it's actually injected into his bones. Yes, but again, I'm just... Because the thing is as well, in that scene where he gets the um, blade lock off the um, metal claws, you see that the claws are coming back first. Yeah. But like slowly but surely. So I'm wondering whether it's just the fact that... Because the one thing is that the adamantium does actually slow down his healing factor. That's the one thing that they always skim over is that the irony being that it's adamantium, it's killing him at the same time as working with him? Well, I think it was... What was it called? Like, film theory. Like, the guy who does all the film theories. I think he explained it really well, why Wolverine was dying in Logan. I think he explained it really well, and it made a lot more sense. Because it's not actually the adamantium that's killing him. Well, no. it, is in a, it is in a way... But it's not the main thing that's killing him. Well, the thing is, is like... Comic... Ex uh, I don't think it was Comics Explain. I think it was Comic Story. It came up with a really good point last year, or maybe the year before. But technically, if it wasn't for the adamantium, Wolverine would be immortal because his healing factor would allow for him to just stay what at a peak physical point and wouldn't age any further but because during the logan um comic story it is revealed that the adamantium is actually poisoning him that's why he's aging up and that's why he's so slow it's because his healing factor is working overtime to compete with the radiation from the adamantium except from Days of Future Past to Logan, that's only a year's jump. And he's aged so much just in that one year. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I try to that's wrap my head on that. That's a lot of damage, a lot of aging just for it in a year. Well, I mean, the only thing I can logically say on that is the fact that it's just, it's a very stressful job being a Wolverine. Yeah, but <laughs> and also another plot hole. The plot holes just keep on coming. Trask in Epsom, Trask in the Last Stand is a tall black man. Mm -hmm. Yet we have the canon version, which is in uh, first, which is in Days of Future first Past. Or Days of Future Past. Days of Future Past. Yeah. So in Last Stand, we got. Trask, who is a tall black man, but then we got him in Days of Future Past, which is a short white midget. Which is what it should have been from the comics. So, why? <laughs> I mean, the only thing I could kind of logically say is that maybe the original Trask, which is the short white guy, died because obviously midgets don't live forever, they don't have a, as long a life. Is coincidence he took the same job and had the same name? Maybe it's like his adopted son, but then the thing that I'm trying to figure out is that 
If in Days of Future Past he had the technology available to create the Mark I version of Sentinels, at that point, why weren't they brought in sooner from the original movies? Because when you get up to Days of Future Past, the reason why they go back in time is because the Sentinels had been modified to the point where they had Mystique's ability to shift up and have the ways of combating yeah. against them. But... <sighs> That would then make the point that, well, whose technology is it then? If Trask died, because Mystique is the one that kills Trask in the original timeline, whose technology is it to be able to mimic her ability to shapeshift and mimic everyone else's ability? <laughs> oh, you're tearing me apart! As we like to say on this channel, it's more plot holes than Swiss cheese. But it is, like... <laughs> The, uh, it's trying to piece together so much, but we don't have enough string. We really don't. No, and very few answers. We can only speculate and like speculate amongst ourselves and come up with some come up with some answers or at least some plausible theories. But there's a few which, well, more than a few because this thing's littered with them. And I would love for the directors and the writers just to come out, and just give us an explanation. But either way, we're not going to be happy with the answers we get. No, and then the other thing that we have to perhaps add in to a degree is where the fudge does Deadpool fit into the rest of this? Given the fact... You mean where, Deadpool, did you say? Yeah, where does Deadpool fit? Because oh, this no, is where... Oh, get me started. <laughs> yeah, this is where things get really fudgy, okay? Because Deadpool's meant to be set in the modern day, but then Deadpool 2... There's that funny little scene that I love to bits where you see the Days of Future Past crew doing oh, their yeah, where, Dark Phoenix. Where, where, like, now's Deadpool shoots the old one. Well, there's that, but there's also the scene where you've got the Dark Phoenix lot where they're closing the doors because they're filming their movie. But that's meant to be set in the 80s, and yet Deadpool 2 is meant to be set in modern day. <laughs> so, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but... Obviously, like Deadpool 2 goes back in time and shoots the Weapon 11 version of himself, which everybody hates. Like, nobody hate, likes that version of Deadpool. It made no sense. Um, and it's also trying to figure out as to where he's going to fit when it comes to Deadpool 3, because it's going to be part of the MCU. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> like, we... <laughs> We've been racking our brains for months. Ever since we heard the idea that Deadpool 3 is going to be part of the MCU, we can't for the life of us figure out how. No. But is there anything else we want to add today before we wrap things up? Yes, there's just one more, just one more. This can partially be explained, but not really, if that makes sense. But anyway, um... Wolverine and Sabretooth being half-brothers, I think they're the same mum, but different dads, I think? No, uh, same dad, different mums. Yes, but they had, like, very sort similar, similar mutations, but not exactly the same. So, if, so we have, we have seen the feral version, which we have of Wolverine, which is partially... Partially Weapon X, but we see another version where what would have happened if he hadn't been injected with adamantium and he turns into like a feral beast that for some reason there's no notes. But we'll skim past that. So we see that feral version, but also Sabretooth transforms into us into that kind of version as well. So we see that since Wolverine has had the adamantium, he doesn't turn into that feral form, which would make a little bit of sense. But Sabretooth did not, as he didn't have the procedure. And we see that through con because of continuity in X-Men 1, he's a lot more feral. He's more like an animal, which that would make a lot more sense why he's more feral and Wolverine isn't. But what it does not explain, however, is Wolverine, we, can, we know why he doesn't have his memory because of the adamantium bullet. We know why he doesn't have a memory, why he would not remember his brother Sabretooth. But in X-Men 1, Sabretooth should have remembered Wolverine. 
Yes, because the one thing that they went over during the Wolverine Origins thing is that they can smell each other's scent because that's the other thing that they both have as a mutation is they have heightened smell. And being the fact that they're biologically brothers, they would be able to know who one another were. Yeah, so obviously Wolverine wouldn't have had a clue, but Sabretooth no. should have. Yes, but I, I suppose the only logic being that he was so feral... Because the thing is, that poor actor didn't have a single line. He just growled. He he had... Well, he did have, like, a few lines, but I think there was a really funny joke that I saw in uh, in a Matthew Santori YouTube video. I think all of Sabretooth's lines you could fit into a single tweet. <laughs> yeah, I just... I feel sorry for that actor. Like, he looked really cool, don't get me wrong, but it just seems so stupid that he just... <sighs> I thought That's... Liev Schreiber did a really good job with Sabretooth as to, I don't know, it kind of, I like the way it fleshed out the kind of brother relationship which they had. I liked that. But there's, there's just that one thing that Sabretooth should have known who Wolverine was. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is I do like the fact that during Wolverine Origins, they both had very thick mutton chops. I don't know if it's just to make <laughs> them look, but I don't know if it was to make them look more Canadian than they already were. But it was just such a bizarre thing because the way they fight as well, I would argue that at that point, Sabretooth was more inclined in his like feral stage because he was being more animalistic because he goes, rrr, 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 rrr. and then you got Wolverine that just goes, yeah. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. That's how, don't get me wrong, Hugh Jackman did an amazing job as Wolverine. But time and time again, whenever he fights, it just makes me laugh that his go-to thing is... Ah! <laughs> there is one last thing, which is actually a question from me to you, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's something which I can't explain, because unless maybe mutants were accepted around that time and they got a book deal or whatever, why is there comic books about the X-Men in Logan? I think and it why was... is there action figures? I think it's more as a way it could have been like a weird publicity stunt thing to try and make them more accepting. I, because like I don't know, because there's a deleted scene. There's a deleted scene with one of the kids when Logan sees one of the kids in the hideout in Logan near to the end of the film, playing with Sabretooth and Wolverine. They're fighting each other. But mm -hmm. it's the saber tooth that we see in the cartoons. Yes. So I'm like I'm just sat there, just like my brain just crushing on itself. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it could be just the thing of like a society thing because obviously there's so few mutants left. Perhaps it's like the X Men were like the he heroes for them to strive for, and then you've got the Brotherhood of Evil, which is what they shouldn't be. But then again, they never go by the Brotherhood of Evil. They just go by the Brotherhood, I think, in the movies. Yeah, they do. But again, like... What, what movie is it? It's... I think it's Apocalypse, where you have Toad, where he's randomly flipping burgers. Yes! yes and again, actually. it makes me wonder, like, well... How come he's got goggles? He looks more toad-like there than he did in the other movies. Yeah, he but looks the... very human in X-Men 1. But the other thing as well is that that's set in 2000, but yet he's younger there than he is in the 80s because he's meant to be like 20 or so in... Ugh. Everybody or everybody in these movies seems to have like either Benjamin Button syndrome or something because they don't seem to age right. Yeah, although I'm hoping that I love Deadpool takes the piss out of the films quite a lot because he actually uh, points out real things about it. Yes, he does, because he points out, I think there's like in Deadpool 2 where he goes, is it McAvoy or is it um, Patrick Stewart? Because he's trying yeah. to figure out where Charles Xavier is because he's going yeah, around on his like first, chair. It was in the first um, Deadpool film where Colossus is dragging... Uh, is dragging uh, Dead Deadpool off, and he's like, "We're going to take, I'm going to take you to the professor." And he goes, "Which one, McAvoy or Stewart? These timelines are so confusing." Yes, yes. but that's but... another thing. If Deadpool is going to be in the MCU, why is Colossus Russian in Deadpool? Well, 
because he's supposed to be. Like he's. But, but then why is he American in the original? I think it was just the fact that the actor couldn't do a Russian accent. That, uh, that's the general yeah, gist. But continuity. <laughs> yeah, but the other thing as well for continuity is that the Colossus in the Deadpool movie is bigger than the Colossus that we had from the previous movie because, like, the guy that played that Colossus was <sighs> six five. He he wasn't massive, but he was quite tall, considering that um, Hugh Jackman's about six foot. This is what I, I'm hoping when we get a new Wolverine that he is the right height because yeah, because Wolverine the in the comics Wolverine's is five, like five five. He's like five foot three, five foot four. Yeah, he's quite a short guy. Yeah, he's very <laughs> tiny. It's there's a lot of things that we've got to hope and wish and pray for when it comes to the new mutants because there's a hell of a lot of characters they've barely touched on in the previous movies. So they can easily skim over the original mutants, but it's also trying to fit in the logic of a lot of things, like with Psylocke, who originally was Asian, but then she gets taken over by Betty Brand, who is the sister to Captain Britain. It's There's a lot of intertwining to try and figure out if they ever do it. But... Well. If they ever do it, I hope that we either have a series or a film for X-23. Because I know it's been spoken about for years of it being mm-hmm. in the works of an X-23 film or series, which I would die to see. Just because instead of getting a rehash of a new Wolverine, we get like a different story, which an alternative story of X-23, which I'd be really looking forward to see. Well, the thing is with X-23 is that she does have clone sisters because she I think she has three sisters. Yeah. They're all different ages. And the youngest one, I love the fact that she goes by the name Honey Badger. Like she's like meant to look about five or six, and it's like this Well, she's basically the size of the X-23 that we got from Logan. And that's what I love is this tiny little girl is like ah! <laughs> like it's bad. Six-year-olds are bad enough. You don't need to add in like a feral, like uh, X gene as well. But yeah, <laughs> absolutely bloody not. But anyway, this is just the few. Well, few. Where we've rambled on for nearly an hour, as there was a lot to cover and a lot to get through, and a lot of headaches. Which I'm going to go take some paracetamol, drink a load of water, and fall asleep through pure exhaustion. Oh, well, I'm glad we got through this. Next time is going to be Ben's topic. Have you got a topic? I want to go over plot holes within the Power Rangers saga. Like, I love love Power Rangers to death. Don't get me wrong. But there is a lot of plot holes. Too many plot holes. (laughs) I think the biggest plot hole of it all is the fact that Nobody ever seems to realise how many different Power Rangers there are. No, the... because considering... Oh, what is it? Well, I it's... can't even remember how many sets of Power Rangers there are. It's got to be... Well, it's up there. It's been going for almost 30 years now, so if it's one team a year, it's 30 teams, give or take. But how do they very rarely know about each other? I know. like They only seem to know about each other when there's a crossover. And that only happens once every so often. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be looking forward to discussing that. Yeah. So, yeah, that's going to be my topic for next time. And again, thanks for joining us, everybody. We are two dudes and two furry little guys who rant, rave and ramble all things sci-fi, comic book or anything nerdy. And again, we hope to see you all soon. Subscribe to Theory Craft. And don't forget to like the video and turn on notifications for future videos. See you all soon. See you later.